All right, so first, a little bit about me. My name is Joel Martin. Um, I am a principal software engineer at Viasat Inc. Um, at uh, Viasat, I get to build some uh, really cool systems using Clojure, and uh, I work with some amazing people, and I work at a company that has, uh, provides broadband satellite uh, internet. So that's pretty cool. Um, and I just want to thank the uh, Midwest I.O. organizers for organizing a really great conference so far. So thank you. It's been cool. All right. So let's get started. Um, just a quick uh, questions for the audience. Um, so over the last, over the last uh, year or so, how many of you have written non-trivial code in more than one language? OK, a bunch of you. Uh, how, about, uh, how about in the last month? All right. Last week? How about today? Anybody written? <laughs> OK, no. All right. Um, so uh, I guess the, the, the point is that the, uh, uh, or the point I want to make is that the rate of language creation isn't slowing down. Um, so I suspect that most people have heard of uh, uh, probably most of these languages. Uh, the dates are when they were created, first introduced. Um, there's a good chance you've heard of most of these too, um, or at least one of them. Um, but I'd say there's probably a pretty good chance that uh, there's a language in the third list that you haven't heard of. Maybe all of them are new to you. Um, but so all of these languages are actually interesting in their own way, and you can learn things from these languages. They introduce innovative concepts. Um, <clears throat> so you know, we start, our industry really started at a place where uh, our organizations, our companies, uh, basically the, the philosophy was to pick the best language for that organization. If you were uh, a company that made embedded devices, you picked C probably, or assembly before that. But we've transitioned into, uh, well, we, the, the industry transitioned to a place where um, the philosophy be, sort of became the best language for the given task or project. So companies became multi-language. Uh, but today, I would say we've, we've, we've entered an era where it's the best languages, plural, for the system that we're building. Um, so it's a polyglot world. And learning new languages has become part of the job. Um, and a lot of you probably have realized that and would agree with me. Some of you may not, but I'm just going to tell you that this is probably the world you're going to be living in more and more. And the challenge is that learning is work. And work is inherently difficult. Um, <clears throat> so there's a lot of languages out there. The popular ones have a lot of resources for learning, books, tutorials, references, uh, Stack Overflow, questions and answers. Um, but regardless, if you're learning a new language, the typical process is you write Hello World, um, or the book you know, introduces Hello World, so you write it. Um, you learn how to call functions and define them, uh, learn some basic data types, some basic flow control structures, um, and on and on. Um, and the order is not necessarily that, but that's basically sort of the typical process is you introduce the little, little bits and little bits of pieces of the language um, until, until you've, you've learned the whole language. So it's a very uh, gradual process like that. And there's no problem with that. Um, but uh, some of the best learning resources that I personally used are introduce a little bit of humor or narrative into the process. So you may have heard of Learn You a Haskell for Great Good um, or Wise Poignant Guide to Ruby. I think these sort of take the, the language learning process to the next level. But the, the fact is, they're still sort of, they're still sort of the same thing. You're, you're still basically going through the language and sort of this start from the tiniest piece and add a few pieces, add a few more pieces. Um, and you're basically, what you're doing is you're pushing your brain uphill a couple inches at a time until you reach maybe the foothill of that mountain you're trying to climb. And then, for me personally at least, I often diverge from the path. Once I reach a point where I can implement something real, and then I go off and start doing my own thing. Um, but, but in the end, language learning is hard work. Or is it? Um, and that's really what I'm here to talk about. Um, so here's a quote from Charles Kuhnrat. Uh, who wrote a book in 1984 called The Game of Work. And he, he asked the question, why will people pay for the privilege of working harder than they'll work when they're paid? Um, and so just as an example, one of the examples he gives is um, you have, uh, you know, think, think about the people that work in like a meat packing plant where they're going into sub-zero freezers and they have very strong unions that make sure they have, you know, a 10 minute break every hour. Uh, make sure that you know, they're not getting frostbite or getting affected by the, the cold or the, the, the working environment. Um, and yet, I bet a lot of those same people uh, 
on their vacations or their weekends will pay to buy the resources and the gear to go hunting in the dead of winter uh, to get that perfect, you know, that, go on that perfect hunt um, and, you know, not have any breaks and be cold the whole time. And yet, you know, they'll spend $1,000 on the, the car or the, the weather gear to, to be able to do that, and they love it. So the takeaway is that work is not really a thing, it's a state of mind. And so how can we get language learning to that same point? And that's what I'm going to talk about. But first, I'm going to back up and tell you a little bit of personal story for me about language learning. So the year was back in 2013 at a Closure Conch conference on the East Coast. And uh, a colleague of mine, Alan Dipert, he did a lightning talk there. And he talked about, uh, out of curiosity, is anybody, was anybody at Closure Conj in 2013? Awesome, a couple of people, sweet. Um, so you may have seen this. Uh, and uh, so Alan, Alan did a lightning talk, and he talked about a project of his called Gherkin. Uh, and Gherkin was a Lisp, a full Lisp, implemented in Bash. <laughs> this is me at that, at that moment. Um, and so my mind was kind of blown that you could implement this hugely complicated, or what I, you know, this hugely sophisticated, I should say, language um, in, in, in Bash, which is you know, kind of a crazy language if it's even a language. Um, so that, there, it raised the question for me, I wonder what other languages you could build a full Lisp language in. And I actually had a particular language in mind, um, and it's a language that I'm pretty sure nobody else has written a Lisp in, um, and you'll see why in a moment, but I'll get to that. Uh, but I also had, as a reference, um, Peter Norvig of the artificial intelligence fame. He has a, uh, a very small Lisp implemented in Python he calls Lispy. Um, and so I, I kind of use that as a reference model for, for uh, what I was going to do. So I called my Lisp Mal. And uh, I wanted to start, though, not in the language, the challenging language that I knew I wanted to implement it in, but instead I started in a language that I knew pretty well and I knew I had the power to do this and other people had done it before. And so I started. I started in JavaScript, um, and so I implemented, I implemented my Lisp in JavaScript first, um, and it worked fine, um, and I understood, you know, verified that I understood the process. It was my first time creating a Lisp on my own. It's a Lisp interpreter, um, and, then, uh, and then I went on from there to do it in the language that I really wanted to do it in, that Alan had inspired me to do it in. So this is just a quick snippet of the implementation. Can anybody here tell me what language this is? Not Bash. It's not C sharp. <laughs> or C, yeah. What's that? Nope. All right. <laughs> so it was a, I implemented it in Make. And I'd, had, I'd, done, I'd built some crazy big projects in Make before. Too big, in fact, I shouldn't have. Uh, but, um, but I'd used it quite a bit. And so when Alan had made that talk about Bash, I thought, well, I wonder if I could do it in, in GNU Make. Uh, and it turns out I could. Um, and so I called, uh, I've already said the name, but basically I, I called it Mal for make Lisp. Um, and then I had the thought, uh, I should try to implement this same Lisp in Bash. Um, the structure of, of Mal is quite different from Gherkin, um, and so I just wanted to, to challenge my hand to see if I could port that exact same Lisp. It's the same language, um, but implemented in a different target language. And so during this process, I did it, you know, this is another snippet, uh, from it, and uh, I began to see structures and patterns in how, uh, what the best way to do this implementation, this process was. Um, and I started to think in terms of digestible chunks, um, largely due to the fact that, you know, I have a family um, and a full-time job and I'm a PhD student, and so, you know, I had five or ten minute chunks or breaks that I could take from whatever I was working on. Um, and I was forced into, forced into a point where I had to sort of structure this into something that I could work on and make meaningful progress in five or ten minute chunks. Um, so after Bash, I did C. Um, and this was the first statically typed language that I did the implementation in. Um, again, I learned a lot more about how it would probably be better to structure it. And um, you know, in, in this process, I restructured the previous one, previous implementations. And then I did Python because Lispy is part of the, um, the heritage of of, of Mal, um, and I wanted to see if I, you know, the structure had become quite different from what Peter Norvig outlined, and so I wanted to see if I could do it in Python. Uh, no problem. Um, and then Clojure, because um, Clojure was what I used for my day job uh, at Viasat, and uh, 
it, I really modeled Mal's syntax and some of its, its features like immutable data structures on Clojure. And so um, I, you know, I, I, I did an implementation in Clojure. And one of the things I learned here was really the distinction between what pieces of the language really are Lisp specific and what pieces of the implementation are really sort of the incidental complexity from the challenges that that language brings. That's sort of a measure of how different that language is from Lisp. Um, and, uh, but I will point out, though, that uh, one of the things I learned later is that that incidental complexity, in fact, became sort of one of the most useful aspects of Make as it evolved into something other than just a Lisp. Then I did PHP, Java. Um, and during this, this process, I sort of made an accidental discovery, which was that I had I'd sort of stumbled on this very useful personal language learning tool. Um, the, the first language up there that I didn't know that I did the implementation in was PHP. Um, and you know, that, that kind of was enlightening to me in that you know, this same process worked really well, really efficiently for learning PHP. And I felt like I knew PHP really well after doing it. Um, and so during this process, make list became make a lisp. Um, because it, it began to feel like the process I had defined was more important than the language itself. So but before we switch gears and focus on the language learning aspects of the make a list process, um, let's take a brief look at the language itself. All right. Cool. So let's look at the, uh, the Python implementation first. Um, I have a small hello world here. And I apologize for those that aren't too accustomed to Lisp, but Lisp is really just like many other languages, but the parentheses are in, parentheses are in different places. Um, so uh, this is basically just a Hello World program. And so I'm going to run the mal implementation that's written in Python, and I'm going to use it to invoke that Hello World program. All right, so that's pretty trivial. Uh, nothing, no big deal there. So let's switch to, um, let's switch to Bash and uh, do something a bit more interesting. All right, so this is the bash Im implementation of mal, and I'm running a, an, running a program that I made for Clojure West in 2014, and it's basically a, using ANSI escape codes to do uh, a presentation, and this is actually the presentation that I gave at Clojure West um, using, using that, uh, that program written in mal. Okay, but let's, let's actually take it up a notch or three. So I'm gonna use the, uh, oops, in the wrong place, JavaScript implementation. All right, so I'll pause just a second to let you guys do on that. So what I'm doing here is running the, um, I'm using the JavaScript implementation of mal to run the mal implementation of mal. <laughs> so <laughs> this is basically my reaction um, the first time I realized that this was possible and that I, that I accomplished it. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't some magical you know, uh, powers that I had, um, but it was just, it was, it, was, it was surprising to me that this was possible um, and how, how, how fairly straightforward it was and that this, with a f quite a few bug fixes, worked the same in no matter what the underlying implementation is, the mal implementation of mal, the mal, implementation of mal runs on that. And what you just saw um, was I was running the um, using the JavaScript implementation of mal to run the mal implementation of mal. So I'm just going to define an fun anonymous function here that multiplies two numbers. All right, cool. So just so you can see. And this is, this is mal. Um, it looks like many other lisps. Um, and again, this is the mal implementation of mal. So it's a bit mind twisty, but um, it is really cool. So let's continue. All right. So after I did that that uh, lightning presentation at Closure West, Closure West, um, uh, somebody came up to me and afterwards and asked, "So how about PostScript? Have you thought about PostScript?" And I hadn't. Um, and PostScript is a you know it's a typesetting language, but it happens to be a stack-based concatenative Turing-complete language. Um, and so I did the a PostScript implementation of mal. And after that, at some point I did a C Sharp, then a Ruby, then a Perl, then a Go implementation. Rust, Rust happened to be a bit more challenging than average, um, but it is a very interesting language. It has some, some interesting restrictions that, uh, well, I'll let you read about it if you haven't already. Um, then I did R, 
CoffeeScript, VB.net, Scala, Haskell, Racket, Lua, and uh, OCaml. And I, I want to pause here for a minute because um, OCaml is, was an interesting, a new moment in the make a list processor, the MAL evolution, because OCaml was done by somebody else. Um, and I had just made, I had basically just created a document that, dis that described, that wrote down that process I was using to create, uh, to create MAL, the make a list process. Um, and a friend of mine, a colleague, uh, Chris Hauser, Chauser, um, who's also the author of The Joy of Closure, um, he, he created the OCaml implementation. This happens to be the 23rd implementation of MAL. Um, and it, it marked a new era for MAL. And that was, that was January of this year uh, that he created that. Um, and since that point, other people have created more implementations of MAL than I have. And many of the ones I've created have been extensions of other ones like uh, ECMAScript 6 um, or, uh, uh, or, I, or I did it so I could learn a language for a class I was taking like MATLAB. So, um, all right. So here's MAL today. So there are 42 implementations currently. Uh, just in the last month, two more were added um, just a few weeks ago. So the, one, of the, one of them was, called, was done in VimScript, which is a scripting language in, that's embedded in Vim. Um, and the other one was Kotlin, uh, which I had never heard of until the uh, pull request was submitted to me. And Kotlin happens to be a, a language that runs on the JVM, um, but it tries to address the, the, the sort of lots of boilerplate that you often do with Java and also address the compile time for Java. So it generates you know, bytecode that runs on the JVM, but it's an interesting language. Um, and I've, I've discovered a lot of interesting language through this process as people have sent me pull requests. Um, another one I had no familiarity with when, it was, uh, uh, when I saw it was NIM. Uh, it was formerly called Nimrod, but it's a really interesting language. Um, performs like C, but has Python syntax. It's really interesting. Um, so looking at this, you're probably asking why, right? And, and I mean, when I, when I look at this too, that, I, that, that, same, that same question really comes to mind. And the answer is that because it was fun. Um, and not just fun, but it was addictive. Um, it was addictive fun. Uh, I, you know, I'd start an implementation, do the, the, the tiniest little first step, and then from then, you know, I, I just couldn't put it down really. Um, and so whenever I had a few, few minutes of free time, I would come back and do another step to it. Um, so, that, and really that's it. Um, I'm not particularly brilliant or anything like that. It was just, I stumbled, stumbled upon something that was, was fun and easy to do. And um, so I'm going to introduce a, a little buzzword here, so just a buzzword alert. It's, a bit of tire, it's become a bit of a tired term, but um, the term is gamification. And that's really uh, what the theme of this talk is about, um, in that in the make a list process, I sort of stumbled upon a bunch of gamification uh, principles. And, and, and like I said, make a list is kind of the gamification of language learning. So uh, gamification is really not a new concept. So I, I referenced Charles Kunrat before. And uh, he, he wrote a book in 1984 called The Game of Work. Um, and and a, lot of, a lot of the ideas of gamification sort of originated with him. Um, he set down the initial principles. And there's been a lot of research and a lot of writing uh, since then, extensions of the idea and you know, corrections to some of his ideas. And, extensions, um, but really he was sort of, he's considered the grandfather of gamification, although the term itself wasn't until many, many years later when that, 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 that term was coined. Um, so let's just talk about the, the, the five core principles that he outlined. So he said you need to have clearly defined and measurable goals. Uh, you need to have objective and standardized scorekeeping. You need to have a high degree of choice. Uh, you need consistent coaching and a good and a, a well-defined field of play, i.e., the rules of the game. And you need uh, constant feedback. Um, and these these are sort of you know these these are the principles that he identified that are sort of one of the differences between uh, what what we consider work and what we consider play. Um, and that, again, these aren't the only things. You know, people have extended this, and he he I think didn't cover everything that you know is important. But um, but this is what I'm going to focus on in terms of. Of, of the make a list process. Um, and, um, and by the way, I, I don't consider this thing complete. Um, I think there's a lot that can be done to improve it. Um, and so you know, I, I invite all of you to take a look and uh, maybe try it out and, and make improvements to it. But, um, but I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just go into how uh, this, um, uh, the make a list process sort of exhibits these principles. So first, goals. 
Um, so goals, obviously, are your desired result. What, what do you want to get out of it? And you know, as we've already said, uh, learning a new language is, is really, I think, one of the goals of this, uh, this project. Um, and, and as a subset, uh, learning a list, because one way to use this is to do an implementation in a language you already know, um, but you may not know Lisp, or you want to know Lisp more deeply. And that was really, that was sort of how I started, uh, was not, you know, I started, the first one I started with one is JavaScript, which I knew well, but I wanted to learn about Lisp better. And even though I've been doing it uh, as part of my full-time job, uh, writing Lisp, um, making an implementation in Lisp gave me a whole new level of understanding of Lisp. But the problem with these two goals is that they're, they're not really particularly clearly defined, and they're not measurable. And so the real goal, the real crisp goal of the make a list process is to create a Lisp, uh, i.e. a mal implementation. Um, and sort of as the second goal is to get eternal glory, or at least uh, to get cited or included onto the, the, the make a list, the mal project. Um, so if you do the first implementation in a new language, I'll pull that, you know, once it, it reaches my standards, um, I'll pull that into the repository. Um, or if you, do, if you do an implementation in a language that already exists and it's not particularly unique in any way, um, then I'll also, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to cite that implementation link to it. Um, so scorekeeping. Um, that's, this is a measure of progress towards your goals. Um, and in, the make, and in make a Lisp, there are uh, basically 11 scores, points. Um, these are the point, the, the, basically the steps of the process. Um, and so I'll just go through these real quick. So in step zero, you basically do an echo program. Um, so you read input from the user, you write output. It's pretty trivial. But what it does is it gives you the opportunity to set up your environment, um, to start passing some of the tests. Um, and, and believe it or not, in some languages, just reading in strings and writing out strings is more complicated than it might seem. For example, in GNU Make, um, that was, that was Getting to that first step took quite a while. Um, the next step is you basically make a uh, uh, do the the reader and printer of, of uh, traditional Lisp, which is basically your parser to parse the, the the string into your abstract syntax tree in memory, and then take that abstract syntax tree and turn it back into a string. And then from there, you create a simple calculator, a prefix calculator, but it's um, but it is a, just a simple calculator. You add memory. Uh, so you get variables and uh, the ability to have state. And then you add a, key, a few key things that, that actually turn it into a Lisp language. Um, and it seems like a big jump, but it's not really. You add an if structure. Um, you add uh, function, anonymous functions or closures. Uh, and add, add a blocking, the do blocking structure. And, and at this point, you have a Lisp, really. It's a simple Lisp. Um, and then the, the steps after that are increasing the power, gradually increasing the power towards being able to self-host. Um, and so uh, the next step is efficient stack and memory usage. Um, uh, telecall optimization is the primary thing here. Uh, some file I.O., adding the eval function, um, uh, being able to use it at the command line to invoke other mal programs. Um, <clears throat> code templating uh, in Lisp parlance called quasi-coding often, or syntax coding. And then adding macros. And um, some of these aren't technically strictly necessary for self-hosting, but um, e by doing them, you learn a lot and about both Lisp and the language you're implementing in. Um, and so macros are one of those where macros in Lisp basically allow you to define a new language in your Lisp. Uh, so you may have heard the DSL, domain-specific language. Um, Lisps, Lisps really excel at this aspect, and macros are what facilitate that. And then adding exception handling. And finally, just sort of the miscellaneous stuff that you need to combine together to get self-hosting. All right, so another principle um, is choice. So the freedom to choose how, how to succeed, how to reach your goals. And this is, this is really important for making this process both fun and also possible, because a lot of times what will happen is you're, you're targeting a language, and it has just some things that just aren't, aren't a good, you know, are, are a bad match. And so being able to hit your head against the wall and then say, okay, I'll just go on and do something else. And having the freedom to choose to go a different path, um, often, often as you explore the other paths, you'll learn enough uh, about what you need to know about the language to solve the, the, the thing you deferred. Um, so you know, one of the first choices you make, obviously, is the language you want to learn and implement in and the tools that you're going to use for that. Um, that's pretty obvious. Um, but, but as you're doing the implementation, you know, I, don't, I don't tell you exactly how to implement it. And I can't because I don't know what language and what features you're going to have. And so uh, the guide that I'll get to in a minute is, um, you know, it, it, tries to be, it tries to be as generic as possible across different language types. Um, and then 
there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of things that are completely optional. Um, so as I mentioned, step five, where you do tail call optimization, you don't actually need to implement that. Um, if you wanted to use your Lisp in a production system, you would want to, uh, but you can get to self-hosting without that. Um, you just might use a lot of memory to, to run anything interesting. Um, but you don't need to read light editing in history. That's something I list. Um, you don't need metadata across all the compound data types. Um, you just need it on functions, um, which don't tend to be that difficult. Um, and you, uh, you don't need keywords. That's a, a closure, closure feature that is, is not even used by the self-hosting mode. And then there's a bunch of things that are deferrable. So you can, when you get to the step, if you see these, you can say, you know, in the guide, they're listed. It, it explicitly calls them out as deferrable. You can, you can bypass them and, and implement them later. Um, so like the, the vector and hash map types, you know, it's often convenient just to do, just to do the very basic data types for, especially for like reading and printing, uh, the parsing, um, and then get to the, the more complicated things later. Um, and that's fine. Um, so then uh, I, I think one of the main tools and the one, one of the main things that I've created in terms of uh, the make a list process is the guide. Um, and, and this is sort of the, the, the coaching, coaching part of the game where um, unfortunately, uh, I didn't, didn't get on the Wi-Fi, so I can't actually go to the rendered version of the guide. But basically, it's, a, it's just a very step-by-step -step gentle guide to get you set up and give you hints about going. And then it goes through each of those steps and tells you how, how to implement it and gives you hints about you know, different language types and how you might approach that. Um, and so I do have, let's see, I think I do have, uh, so one of the other things is uh, I have pseudocode. Oh, yeah, so part of the guide, Oh, it's full screen, not going to let me change. Hold on. No. Oh. OK, never mind. Anyways, one of the things that I have in the guide is a logical diagram that shows you step-by-step. Uh, step. For each step, there's a diagram that shows you what pieces get added and how they interact with each other. So I wanted to show that, but oh well. Um, I have a pseudocode for each of the steps, and so you can do diff against two pieces of pseudocode and see what new functionality is added in a pseudocode form. Uh, there's a fact online that, that goes into uh, just like why things are structured the way they are and what my expectations are for, you know, if you get a lang complete an implementation, what, what I expect before it, I'll merge it into the main, uh, main repo. And then there's also a mal channel and pre node for that everybody's welcome to come on. It's pretty quiet right now, but I suspect there'll be might be a few more people there. Um, and just come on and be free to discuss all things Lisp or mal or whatever. Um, I can help you with questions there. I probably won't be on for a couple days with travel, but. Um, all right, and then uh, absolutely critical for this is, is frequent feedback. Um, and what that basically is, is measuring your change over time, because there's nothing more motivated than seeing, as you make those little steps of progress, just seeing that you're, you're actually moving and you're not just beating your head against the wall. And so in the make a list, make a list process, you get feedback basically by doing this. Um, you do make test, caret, and the name of your implementation. Or probably more commonly, you would do uh, add the step that you actually want to run so you're not seeing the noise from the previous steps that you did. OK, so just as an overview, the game basically works like this. You, you're on a step. You choose some task from that step from, from the guide or from the pseudocode or from the, you know, the logical diagrams. Um, you think about how you're going to implement it. You Google, you read Stack Overflow, you read references, tutorials, whatever in that language about that specific topic. You try and implement it, you'll fail. The test won't pass. You'll get a syntax error, or whatever. You tweak, you repeat, you keep learning until you've you've implemented that little that little chunk, and you repeat, and then you go to the next step, and you just do that until you're done. Um, and it's easy, but it's um, it's surprisingly motivating when you 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 finally figure out how to do function closure function closures in Java, which doesn't have you know uh, well until recently really didn't have lambdas or that kind of that kind of functionality, but you're implementing another language in that that does. Um, all right, so I'm going to just show you a real quick example of this. All right, so the first thing you have to do, and this is outlined in the guide, is you have to add your implementation to the list. So there's three modifications you have to make to the make file. Um, and I'm just going to copy the Python one to do this. I'm going to call my language foo. So this second part just tells it how to find the, the executable. And then the last modification is basically just telling, telling the makefile how to run that step. Um, and you can copy from the ones that exist already. 
All right. All right, so now I would look up on Stack Overflow if I didn't know Python, how do I do an infinite loop? All right, and then I would look up how do I get user input? And it would look like this. And then I'm gonna put a bug in here. I'm gonna print out the same thing every time. Oop, step zero. What? Shouldn't have passed. Something weird's happening. Hold on. <laughs> cool, always when you're doing a demo, something goes. Oh, I did something wrong with the make file, I think. Added foo, told it how to find it, and then foo run step. Well, what's that? Oh, did I? I did that. Oh, is it going to the Python one? Uh, of course. Yeah, the one thing. Uh, that one's fine. Um, so I forgot to change this. You're right. Thank you. All right. Cool. <laughs> All right, so, <laughs> yeah. Um, so step zero has four tests, um, testing, uh, and they all four failed uh, because uh, if you can see up here, um, uh, the, it, it shows you what it input out and what it expected to get output, and we got that input and we got bar for output. So now if I fix it, All right, and they're all four passing because of the expected input output. I can just show you the test here too, whoops. Test. So this is, the, this is the format for how the tests are written. So it's basically, you have comments in there. There's the input that it gets sent to the program, the output it's expecting. And there's some other, there's some other things you can have in the test file that later tests have that do more complicated things, but this is basically the idea. Um, so that's feedback um, and, and, and the basic game. So, um, so just to just to review, um, that's the that's the basic game process. Um, so now it's uh, you guys' turn. Um, uh, you can take Mal the Make a List process and learn a new language. Yeah, there's probably one you have in mind. I wouldn't be surprised already. Um, you can uh, create a new implementation. Uh, maybe it's a language you already know that there's not an implementation in, and you're wanting to. Uh, increase the coverage of Mal. Um, there's a lot of opportunities here for improving the game. Um, there's a lot of research and gamification that could probably be applied here, uh, more modern uh, techniques. Um, you can improve an existing implementation. Um, probably, you know, at least a few people here have used Haskell and probably know it better than I do. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll admit the Haskell implementation is pretty poor. Um, and I know that because it doesn't perform nearly as well as I expect it to, so there's a challenge for anybody who knows and loves Haskell to improve that implementation or make your own and I'll replace mine with it if it's better. Um, Mal needs a logo, so anybody who's more design inclined than I am um, could use a logo. Um, and then, like I said, there's 42 language implementations and they all follow basically the same structure and so I think, I think there might be some opportunity here for some research that does language comparison because um, I think this is probably a bigger body of work and a, a bigger breadth and probably depth than most other like language Rosetta Stones do. Um, so, so anyways, that's, uh, that's all I have. Um, anybody have any questions? Just some links up here for reference. <coughs> questions? If nobody has questions, I have some extra slides that I'll torture you with. Yeah. So this reminds me a bit of exorcism, if you're familiar with that. It's a, a site where you can solve problems in whatever language you choose. And it uh -huh. gives you, you run against tests and get feedback from random users. Uh, the exorcism code base is, I believe, open source. So if you ever want to turn this into a platform where people could interact with a uh -huh. website to submit solutions to problems and get feedback from other users, uh, you might actually be able to take that code base and do that. I've been considering doing that for a related project. 
Okay, is there another keyboard with exorcism? Because that probably brings up a lot of stuff that's not. Exorcism no, no programming keyboard. language it's or exorcism? A, no, it's just a website. You're just submitting the, uh, no, I got it. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> All right, anybody else? Yep, there's one back there. I think that site is like exorcism.io. It's written by Katrina Owen. Those might be helpful search okay. as well. Um, so you had mentioned that uh, this was a good way to identify what was the essential complexity that Mal had yeah. versus the um, just the you know incidental complexity of the language. Could you give me an example of what sure. of like a language that was really hard um, or that was very unmal like? Yeah, um, so, so just as uh, the contrast where it was easy, like in Clojure, um, I didn't, because it was modeled on Clojure's like data types and syntax and stuff, um, I didn't have to re-implement types, you know, objects or types or, um, you know, I could just reuse what Clojure already had because it mapped really well. Um, the same is actually true of, of Ruby. Um, Ruby mapped really well. It's, it's, it feels like, uh, I mean, I didn't know it before this, but in implementing it, it felt very much like a Lisp that just had a different, you know, a different syntax. Um, uh, one where uh, it was really difficult, well, GNU Make was really quite difficult um, because it doesn't have types, really. Um, I mean, it, it, it sort of has strings, and you're, you, you, the functions operate on uh, space-delimited strings, basically. Um, it doesn't really have, like, a way to create a local variable, although I kind of discovered a way to do it, to hack it in, where... Um, there's a for each construct, which does create, you know, it assigns to a local variable across each thing in a space delimited string. And so if you happen to always use and guarantee that you're always going to have um, uh, no spaces in the thing that you're assigning, then you've got now a let. So you know, just an example that with, that's incidental complexity, but it, you know, it, it, I, I learned something deeply about the language that I would never really have even thought about or even tried to explore, just as an example. Other questions? So I'll just, I'll just throw this up real briefly. It's a little hard to read. It's blurry, but... Um, so I have a micro benchmark that can be run across all the different implementations, and the, the, the y-axis is that how many, how many uh, iterations of this uh, micro benchmark can run in 10 seconds. Um, so it's, it's ordered. Uh, it's just an ordered list of that. And then across the x-axis is there's a, a, a language ranking site called langpop.corver.nl. Um, and if you're familiar with the Red Monk language ranking, this is basically that, but it's updated every day based on Stack Overflow and GitHub data. And so um, up in the upper right are, are languages that perform well on that microbenchmark um, and that are also very popular. So, uh, you know, in the, the upper right-hand corner is Java, um, but also in that same block is Scala and C, C++, C Sharp. Um, oh, and the color, the color, by the way, the, the fill and stroke are basically the types of languages, so whether it's statically or dynamically typed, and then sort of what syntax model. And the size of the bubble is the, line, the number of lines of code excluding comments. Um, but I think, I think one of the most interesting things on this graph actually is the upper left-hand quadrant, where you have languages that perform really well, but aren't that well known. Um, so just, I'll, I'll just point out a couple here, unless, unless there's other questions, by the way. I don't want to supersede those. But, um, so... Uh, actually, the, the language that performs the best is R Python, believe it or not. Um, and it's a statically typed version of Python, basically, uh, a restricted subset. And it has a JIT in it, so it has it leverages both static type inference and uh, the, the just-in-time compilation. Um, and you know, I, ha I haven't dug into it in detail, but it, it, it performs even better than the other implementations. Um, but a couple of others that are interesting in that category are Crystal, which is a statically typed Ruby. Um, there's a smaller one in that, that same corner called NIM. I mentioned that earlier. It's basically a statically typed uh, Python syntax. Um, it's not Python, but it's, it, it borrows a lot of, from that syntax. Uh, Kotlin is also in that quadrant. Um, OCaml. Uh, Factor is another stack-based language, which happens to be uh, one of the smallest implementations um, and also one of the, it, it is the best performing dynamically typed language. So, you know, anyways, that, that quadrant's kind of interesting. Um, I'll just throw these up real quick. This is in case you think it's 42 has almost exhausted the languages out there, here's a bunch of languages that haven't been implemented, so scan this list real quick and see if there's one up there that you want to learn and or do it mal implementation in. Um, and then, so that I'll just finish right here, so. Yes? Uh, what was the 
There was a tiny little dot in the bottom left hand corner. I'm curious what language that is. Okay, so bottom left corner, that's mal itself. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I don't really have a, obviously a popularity rating for it, uh, so I just put it basically almost at the end. Um, and uh, uh, I mean, it's slower. It's slower than all the others, really, because it's you know it's doing so much overhead. It's not a compiler. Mal is an interpreter. Um, it's not a, it's not a compiled Lisp, so um, it's slow. But it's also small because I can leverage a lot of things that already exist and and really just have to implement just the Lisp parts of the language. Um, and then there's another one that people might find entertaining. Uh, one that I made. It's a new language called Minimal, um, and it's basically it's basically Okay, uh, it's basically the mal language, but uh, using JSON for the syntax. So, all right, that's all I have. I think I'm out of time.